Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Welcome, wildlings. Legends have a particular mystique by dint of the effect they've had on generations of minds, hearts, and souls. It's a completely different matter to face one down in person. Add to that the horror, fog, and atrocity of war, and you have tonight's scary scenario, The Call of the Revenant, found on the Creepy Pasta Wiki. September 21st, 1945. Dear Abigail, it's been so long since I've seen you, since I got to hear your laugh, since I got to see you smile. I bet you're still as gorgeous as the day I met you. Sadly, I can't say the same about myself. Abby, you have no idea how much I hate writing this, but I don't want to shock you when you see me in the flesh. I've been wounded. Quite seriously, though, I haven't really let it sink in yet. I'm pretty sure that I'm close to a breakdown, so I need to get this all out of my system. I was with three others, McCamey, Corgan, and Bennett. All three were older and more experienced than I was, having been some of the first boys to sign on, willingly, whereas I got drafted a few years later. McCamey was the oldest of our group, and he took it upon himself to teach me how to survive it under fire. I never would have made it past the first few weeks if it hadn't been for him. Corgan was the second oldest of the group, and he'd been one of the first in the trenches. He'd done some incredible things, but he was a silent, morose man, and I never did learn much about him beyond his name and where he'd been stationed. You know how there are some people that just rub you the wrong way? Well, Bennett was one of those guys. I'm sure he was from a well-to-do family, and if I had to bet money, he had probably tried to bribe the drafters to let him stay home. I've never met a more nagging, self-centered son of a bitch in my life. And we were stuck with him. And we clashed constantly over the most trivial of shit. But thankfully, I had McCamey's company, and he was a decent guy. He told good jokes, shared the stash of cigars with us, and he acted as the leader of our little band, which I'm sure ruffled Bennett's feathers no end. You remember that letter that I sent you? The one where I said that we'd be coming home a few weeks early? I'm sad to say that I've been delayed. Although, in this case, it was for a good reason. You see, even though Hitler was dead and most of his empire had fallen, there were still some rats in the rubble. And some of us were called back to provide what we like to call pest control. Our unit was on the trail of one Johann Hess and some of his toadies. Hess, mean son of a bitch Nazi if ever there was one, was the kind of man who would smile at you like he was your friend, shoot you in the gut as he did, and not ever take his eyes off yours. He was one of the last remaining scumbags in Hitler's higher echelon. From what I was told, it sounded like he was a member of Hitler's occult group, the Tule Society. I didn't know much about it when we went in, but now I've learned that Hitler was obsessed with various forms of magic, alchemy, voodoo, pagan rites, even the Jewish Kabbalah that some say Rabbi Loeb of Prague used to make a golem. Pretty crazy, right? I also found out that the Tool Society had been conducting global investigations in countries that they deemed places of interest. Africa, Haiti, uh, Greenland, Scotland, Saudi Arabia. Looking back, I don't think that knowing any of this beforehand would have helped. I'm not the most historically versed gent in the world and I wouldn't have cared or remembered all of the info. All I was concerned with at the time was Bag and Hess. But I can't stop myself from wondering if things might have gone differently if my comrades and I had even the slightest inkling as to what we were up against. We were crossing through the Vishka Forest. It's a pretty big place, big enough so that it seems like it goes on forever. It's filled with the tallest trees I have ever seen. And it was so damn quiet in there. 
I never saw a single fox, rabbit, or bird while I was in there, and the others didn't see any either. We'd been in the forest for about a day, and the sun was going down. It was getting colder, and the sounds of the animals were getting louder as we went deeper in. Why can't that stupid kraut just surrender? We've been here too damned long, whined Bennett, earning him a glare from McCamey. Shut up, Bennett, they growled. We might actually catch him if you keep quiet. Bennett scowled, but he did as he was told. That was another thing about him that I didn't like. He was a coward. And cowards, well, they have no place in the trenches or on the battlefield. He stayed silent until we set up camp. The spot we picked was a small hill surrounded by trees on all sides, littered with old stones that jutted up from the ground in such a way as to provide excellent cover should we come under fire. I'd unrolled my bedroll and I was about to lie down when I heard a long, low, whistling howl that seemed to split the night like a missile through a cloud cover. Each of us started and turned heads out in the direction of the howl. The sound had come from the north of the hill, which was densely wooded save for a clearing that was big enough to be seen from our vantage point. The howl died down quickly, but none of us moved or spoke for a few good minutes. The one who broke the silence was Bennett, who asked, What the hell was that? in a low, trembling voice. I could see the desire to run away on his face clear as day. I don't know but it didn't sound like any wolf I've ever heard, muttered Corrigan, his hand straying to his sidearm. You think Hess and his goons were the ones making those sounds? I asked McCamey. The old soldier opened his mouth to reply, but he was interrupted by the sounds of distant gunfire. Then the racket stopped, or was cut off abruptly, and the suddenness of it made sure that any hopes that we had of getting some shut-eye were completely dashed. For the next few hours, we sat crouched behind some of the stones, guns at the ready. My grip on my rifle was so tight, it was a wonder that I was able to uncurl my fingers after the first hour had passed. The feeling of dread that hung over the camp was like a fog. I could taste it in the back of my throat like bad medicine. Now, I've learned the hard way to be wary, Abigail. I learned from watching my comrades get cut down in ambushes from waiting in muddy trenches and listening to the airplanes roar overhead, from seeing the shadowed SS soldiers pouring out from their tanks like jackbooted ants. I felt like we were under attack, but there were no bullets or bombs, nothing. I couldn't even hear any birds around us. All I could hear was the wind sighing through the trees. My fellow soldiers, they were looking itchy too. They fingered their triggers or plucked at their fatigues restlessly. Eventually, McCamey and Corrigan ventured a ways down the hill to gather firewood while Bennett and I watched their backs. Once the fire was lit, I let its warmth loosen my joints and tried to calm down best I could, but the unease was still coiled around my heart like a python. I decided to get up and pace the camp, letting the fire's glow illuminate my path. It was this glow that led me to notice something about our surroundings that I hadn't picked up on before. The stones we were using for cover weren't spaced naturally. There was an artificiality about their positions and their distances apart that I hadn't noticed before. They were arranged in a pattern. I paced it out and drew a mental picture of it, and what I got was the impression that the stones formed a crude spiral with our campfire resting right in the center. Something about that mental picture made me shudder. I don't know what it was, but it ratcheted up the tension in my body quickly. I decided to stop looking around and then return to the campfire. I was just getting to the point where I could feel the heat on my cold cheeks when we all heard the sound of panic gasping and heavy footfalls crashing through the undergrowth. We barely had time to ready our guns before a thin, wild-eyed man leaped out from the darkness and fell to the ground. Panting and wheezing in the fire's light, I could see the black cloth coat, the muddy jackboots, and the silver swastika pinned to his lapel. 
Then the man raised his hand and said in thickly accented English, Please, for the love of God, protect me! We all stared at him and recognized the man to be Johann Hess, the man that we were after. Bennett was surprisingly the first to move forward. Well, 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 looks like we don't have to find this fucker, because the crowd found us. He laughed at his own joke, but the rest of us were too stunned to respond, not just by Hess's sudden appearance, but by the animal terror that burned behind his eyes in place of the cold, uncaring gaze that I'd seen in his photos. You have to get me out of here, he cried again, getting to his knees. It won't be long before... Bennett slugged him in the face with a growl of, Shut it, you Nazi piece of shit. We're going to get you out of here, all right, but we ain't taking you to Tahiti. You're going away for a long damn time. I don't care, shouted Hiss, ignoring the blood running down his face. It's coming. What's coming? Asked McCamey, intervening before Bennett could hit him again. He crouched next to the terrified man and repeated the question in a calm voice. Hess let out a whimper, and I was shocked to see actual tears in his eyes. We were running from you people, began Hess. There's a place not far from here that's a designated bunker. Only a select few of us know about it. It's near the clearing. Who else is with you? Asked McCamey, his voice still soft. Or a Grimmel, Arnold Kraus, Emil Tot, said Hess his voice still teetering near hysteria. Where are they? asked Corrigan, sounding impatient. The Nazi shook his head. Dead. All dead. It took them. The stillness fell over the camp the moment those words left his lips, and I felt the hair on the back of my neck prickle. What the hell are you talking about? asked Bennett, trying to mask his growing fear and failing. Hess's breathing began to quicken as he raised his dirty, cut-covered hand to his mouth and bit at his knuckles. I watched as he sobbed brokenly through his teeth. We, we were at the bunker, he whimpered. We didn't know that it was a place of interest until later. It was built near an old graveyard, one that was here before the Christians came, a, a pagan burial ground. Bennett started to interrupt, but a harsh shh from McCamey silenced him. Some of the men who were there previously had been uh, excavating it, continued Hess, his eyes glazing over as his hand dipped limply to the ground. They had several items of personal interest to the Fuhrer, uh, old grimoires. Uh, ceremonial daggers and an iron coffin. An iron coffin inscribed with runes and held shut with chains. I'd been there previously and had overseen some of the work uh, b b before I was called back. Hess swallowed thickly and shuddered. I could feel the cold begin to nip at my fingertips and I shivered. When we returned, we found that everyone in the bunker was dead. They'd been torn apart like some wild animal had been at them. And there were bullet casings everywhere, a whole field of them. But we didn't find any bodies. There weren't even any footprints in the blood. All of the men had been killed before they could even run. Off in the distance, I, I thought I heard something moving through the trees. And, and the coffin, it, it was open and it was empty, continued S. Then we heard it moving, moving through the darkness, something fast, not human, and Unter mentioned, but not. He was silent for a moment and it took some prodding to get him talking again. Gimmel uh, uh, tried to fire on it, but it caught his head in its hands and it, crushed it like it was made of clay. We ran, but it caught Tot and then Kraus, and it dragged them away. To do what? asked McCamey, his face stony. Why are you indulging him? snarled Bennett. He's lying to us. Just shoot him. Bennett, shut up, said Corgan, his voice steely. 
Bennett rounded on him with his gun in his hand. Try some, you stupid cowardly shit heel. Corrigan narrowed his eyes and took a step forward. Put that gun away, rich boy, and we'll see who's a coward. Their bickering grew in volume and intensity, but my eyes were still fixed on Hess, who was shaking like a whipped dog hearing the sound of a belt. His eyes went from one side of the camp to the other, hardly blinking. McCamey stood up and went over to intercede, so I was the only one within hearing distance to actually hear what Hess whispered next. The Revenant, the undying ghoul, they released it, now it's after me. To take me and eat my flesh, to take my soul, to live even longer, to live forever, and to keep eating. Untoten, it knows my name, it knows my name. Somewhere close by, a, a twig snapped, and then the cold grew worse, spreading deeper into my bones like liquid. The wind picked up, and the fire guttered, dimmed, and then flared upwards like a spear of light. Voice came into the camp from all sides, coming in on the cold breeze that stirred the thin branches of the trees and made the leaves rustle. Despite the noise, the voice was still distinct above everything else. It was chilling. The voice was so lonely and yet so angry. It made me want to run as fast as I could away from the camp. You see it? shouted Hess, getting to his feet and pointing to the shadows that lay just outside the campfire. It's here! It's here! It came for Kraus, it came for Gimmel, it came for Tot, and now it's coming for me. Mein Gott in Himmel, it's almost here! Corrigan grabbed the Nazi and threw him to the ground as the rest of us rose to our feet and readied our guns, training them at the deep darkness around us. There was a moment of silence in which I could hear nothing but my own heartbeat. And then the voice called out again, closer, but still impossible to pinpoint. Bennett, still hot from his argument, was the first to fire, letting off a spray of lead that was swallowed up by the darkness. He kept firing until his gun clicked empty, and by that time he was soaked in sweat and his eyes were wild. The voice was even closer now, and it seemed to me that all of the loneliness and anger that I had heard before had transformed into something else. It sounded hungry. Come out and fight, you coward! roared Bennett, searching his pockets for more ammo. Just as he'd pulled out a handful of bullets and was starting to reload, a figure shambled out from the deep shadows and came into the light. Honey, have you ever seen one of those dime store horror comics before? The ones that have zombies or living corpses on the covers? Those illustrated monsters are as close as I can get to a good comparison of the creature that came into our camp that night. It was tall and dressed in tattered rags that flapped around its gaunt body in the wind. Its skin was all dried out, brown like leather and wrinkled like old newspaper. Its lips were shriveled away into nothing and its teeth were white, far too white to belong to something that had been dead for so long. The rest of its face was skeletal caved in in some spots and I could see the tiny ribbons of fungus in the holes where bone had been. It didn't have eyes either, just two deep dark sockets that stared ahead into space. But despite that, I got the feeling this thing could see just fine. It took everyone a minute for what we were seeing to finally sink in, and by then, the Revenant had already made its way into the heart of the camp. Bennett was the first one to start screaming, and that scream jolted us out of our horrified stupor. McCamey, Corrigan, and I aimed all of our guns at the thing and fired. The bullets tore through the Revenant in tiny little flurries of dust, but it just kept coming. It said opening its lipless mouth and pointing a withered finger at the cowering Nazi who broke out into what sounded like a prayer. Corrigan was the first one to run out of bullets, but when that happened, he opted to try attacking it with his bowie. He unsheathed it and ran at the Revenant, bringing it up and then down in a deadly arc as he did. The thing just 
caught the knife with one hand and tore it free from Corrigan's grip. The sound of his fingers snapping like sticks echoed across the camp. Corrigan howled in agony as he fell to his knees and I could see the blood gushing from the pulped mass that had once been his hand. And then it grabbed Corrigan by his scruff, hauled him up off the ground with one hand, and it threw him, still screaming, into the fire. I can still smell his hair burning. Bennett was the next to die. The revenant simply lashed out with one hand and broke the poor bastard's neck. That left me, McCamey, and Hess. The revenant moved closer, still hissing Hess's name. McCamey fired off a few more shots at close range, but the bullets had no effect on it. So he reached for one of his emergency flares, probably hoping to light the living corpse on fire. But Hess moved quicker. He reached around and unsheathed McCamey's knife, and then he held it to his throat. Turning to me, he barked, Stop that monster or your friend dies! What could I do? I couldn't let my only remaining friend in this godforsaken country die, so I reached out and I took the flare from his belt. Then I lit it up and faced the undead monster. The red net was close enough now for me to see the atrophied muscles beneath its leathery hide move and contract. Its breath fell upon me and it was so cold it burned. Then it opened its mouth just once more and said in that awful whispering hiss of a voice, Come. Screaming in terror, I lifted up the flare and threw it as hard as I could. The red flame made contact with the dried rags that clung to the revenant's body and they burst into flame. But the revenant kept coming. Even as the smoke began to drift up through the hollow eyes and rotted mouth, even as the bloated stomach popped like a blister and spilled the slime and crusted remnants of its last meal, even as it reached out for me, the last thing that I felt before passing out was its hard, bony hand pressed against my face and the flame searing my skin. I awoke some time later. The campfire had gone out, the darkness of the night was giving way to the pale blue of dawn, and both McCamey and Hess were dead. McCamey lay a few feet from me, his blood drying in a vague halo around his head. His throat had been opened wide by Hess, probably in a last-ditch effort to save his own skin. At least he died quickly. I found Hess, or what was left of him, hanging from a stake amidst the cold embers of the campfire. His body had been torn apart, and what hadn't been taken had been placed inside a crude bag made from his own pale skin. The revenant was gone, with only a few smoldering footprints and some charred scraps of desiccated flesh to mark its presence in the first place. My face felt like it had been doused in hot grease, and it was only after I managed to stumble back to civilization that I saw what the revenant had given me in retaliation for standing in the way of its prey. Abigail, the revenant burned its handprint onto my face. The doctors say the scarring won't be too bad, but it'll still be noticeable, and it still throbs with pain. Sadly, I can't get any skin grafts, as the doctors say that they don't have the equipment to do that procedure. I hope that you can still be with me, even with my new face. Something tells me that I'll be needing your company for a very long time. I can still hear the revenant's call sometimes, but when it's dead of night and I'm trying to sleep, I know it was real. I know I'm not crazy, but I haven't told anyone else but you. Please, don't tell anyone else. Just, if you could, please wait for me. And when I get back, you can see the evidence for yourself. I love you, Abigail. And that's what's been getting me through the night. With deepest love, John Lance. So... Should you ever find yourself in a situation this extreme, dealing with the undead, unstoppable eldritch horror, maybe let it have the war criminal and just bring back what's left. Stay scary, my wildlings. Remember, you can't finish a mission if you're dead and make the most of your nights. <laughs>